3,000 years ago, an extraordinary people rose from humble beginnings to force their will on the world and create the greatest empire mankind had ever seen. An empire that stretched from Britain to the Middle East, lasted a thousand years and shaped the way we live today. I'm Larry Lamb, actor, radio presenter, and history fanatic. I'm like a kid at Christmas. In this series, I'm traveling back beyond the marble monuments to ask who these people were and why they were so successful. Wow. wow. From the empire's earliest ruins to her first conquests in Africa, from kingdom to republic, from Romulus and Remus to Julius Caesar, I want to uncover the extraordinary story of how Rome became the world's first superpower. Forty-nine BC, an army stands on the banks of a river in northern Italy. If the soldiers cross, it will mean war and perhaps the destruction of Rome itself. If they don't, their general faces the loss of his great wealth and lifelong exile. The river was the Rubicon. The army was Roman and its general was Julius Caesar. In 65 BC, Julius Caesar was a young public official on the lower rungs of the political career ladder. He was from a patrician family, but he already had a reputation as a highly effective operator. But that didn't stop him being extremely ambitious for power, wealth, and popularity. It should have been easy for the young Julius Caesar. He grew up in Rome, part of a well-to-do family. His father and uncle held top jobs in government, but their investments had turned sour and the family had lost its money. Caesar could have been penniless, and in wealthy Rome, that would end the ambitions of almost anyone, but not Julius Caesar. So if he had no money, but he's got a name, how did he move himself forward? He has something to his credit. This is the greatest orator of his day, and everybody said it, even Cicero. So this is a person who can scheme. This is a person who can think. This is a person who can manipulate and speak so well. Caesar got himself appointed as Adil, a junior post, but with high profile, in charge of staging Rome's famous gladiatorial games. If Caesar did the job right, he could wow the public with flamboyant displays, make himself the talk of the town and build a reputation. So he planned a year of the most extravagant gladiatorial shows Rome had ever seen. But he had a problem. In Rome, an aedile had to pay for all this extravagance from his own pocket. He doesn't have the money, but he's got the name. He has the right to run for the office. Well, who's going to pay for it? So he finds people. He convinces people. Look, I'm someone that you want to bank on. You're going to get a return for your investment. And that's exactly what happens. So he uses his name to get the job. The job needs money, but he has to borrow the money to do the exactly, job. Exactly, exactly. It was the first gamble of Caesar's career. As Adil, he could make the big splash he was hoping for, but would he ever be able to afford to pay back his loans? One thing was certain, he needed the cash. Today, Rome is an expensive city where money talks. Grazie. Around 60 BC, it was no different. Its vast empire fed Rome the wealth of the world, and everything had a price. 
Why this need for more money? It's never about building up the cash just to have a great stockpile and think, oh, I'm wealthy. You use that money to do favors for other people. You keep on spending or you loan out to somebody else or you borrow from someone else. So the money is moving, creating and adding to all the obligations, all the friendships, all the debts. Caesar understood this more than anyone and spent more than anyone. The extravagance of his gladiatorial games was unrivaled. And sure enough, by the end of his term as Aedil, Caesar had made his name famous throughout Rome. But now, he was 31 million sesterce in debt, bankrupt, and facing total ruin. If your career goes sour, if you don't win the next office and the chance to make more money and pay back at least some of it, then suddenly things are pretty bleak and you're forced into a desperate situation where it's exile or face political humiliation. It was time for the second great gamble of Caesar's career. Wealth flooded into Rome from its expanding empire, where ambitious generals governed the provinces and lined their pockets at the expense of local tribes. If Caesar could get a piece of this action, his money worries would be over. But how could he do it? You didn't get command of legions and a province just like that, least of all in Rome. Caesar had had to make a political deal with two other equally ambitious Roman generals. This deal came to be known as the Triumvirate. It was a cosy private arrangement between three men who represented wealth, influence and military prowess. Adrian, who were the main players? The first one and the oldest is Crassus. He's known as Dives, the rich, because he's one of the wealthiest men in Rome. And he uses his money to win influence and favor. Crassus needs favors to make sure that some of his other investments in business interests don't turn bad on him. Now, the next one is Pompey. He's the man who clears the Mediterranean of pirates. He conquers most of the East, organizes the provinces there. But what he wants is approval and ratification for his reorganization of the eastern provinces, but also land for his veteran soldiers. Caesar is the man who in office can actually get these things done. The triumvirate agreement didn't come out of the blue. Crassus had already heavily bankrolled Caesar. And Pompey was married to Caesar's daughter. Now, by combining their ambitions, these three men would carve up the empire. Caesar persuaded the Senate to appoint Crassus and Pompey to top jobs. Pompey was made consul of Rome itself and governor of southern Spain. Crassus was given free reign over Syria, a vast land of untapped wealth. In return, Caesar was made governor of Gaul, an unconquered chunk of northern Europe, and given command of 20,000 soldiers. No Roman from this era was more determined to be remembered than Julius Caesar. And even whilst he was fighting an epic campaign, he managed to write his military memoirs, commentaries on the Gallic Wars. And this wasn't just for posterity, this was PR. Caesar wanted everyone to read about his exploits and, while campaigning in Gaul, published his memoirs back in Rome. 2,000 years later, it means Caesar himself can be my guide. As I head to France to find out what happened when Rome's greatest general took on its deadliest enemy. Ever since they'd sacked the city in 390 BC, the Gauls had been Rome's bogeyman. Now, 300 years later, Caesar was planning to take the fight right to them. If he could pull off this double whammy, clear his debts, make his fortune, he'd become a national hero, a true legend. Caesar was an effective politician, but as a general, he was devastating. 
The statistics for his campaign show how right from the start in 58 BC, his army of 20,000 men sliced through Gaul. In just eight years, Caesar took 800 towns, pacified 300 tribes, and fought against three million men. But of course, it wasn't just land he was hungry for. That's why I'm heading for the northern edge of Gaul and the island of Jersey. It was here that two men, metal detecting in a field, discovered the very thing Caesar had been looking for all along. We started digging a tiny pilot hole. Yeah. I started digging a big pilot hole <laughs> and finally went down and down and in the end we pushed this spade in as far as we could and rocked it yeah. and I turned the thing and flipped the spade up and he shouts out, it's hard, because on the end were five of these corroded Iron Age coins. How extraordinary. Rich and Reg had found a hoard of ancient silver coins, but it was only when the excavation got underway they realised the scale of their discovery. Came out on a crane because it's weighing nearly three quarters of a ton. But the bit when it dawned on me when it was referred to several times, the largest in the world, yeah. then suddenly you think, wow, hang on, I've done something worthwhile in my life. Rich and Reg had found the biggest hoard of ancient coins in the world. And this is it. Nearly 70,000 coins held together by mud and corrosion and worth millions to Julius Caesar. This must weigh a huge amount. Yeah. 500 kilos of gold and silver. This is about five times bigger than any hoard we've seen before. So, you know, the sheer size of it came as an enormous surprise. Neil and his team are investigating the hoard coin by coin and have revealed how the date and origins of this treasure could prove an extraordinary link to Caesar's story. Where do you think they came from? We've got a pretty good idea about that because when we take coins off this and clean them up, they look just the same as ones we found before from a tribe called the um, Coriosolite tribe. And they lived on, on the French mainland quite close to us. Why did they bury this, do you think? Well, the one thing we do know is that the date obviously relates to the uh, in invasion of Gaul by Julius Caesar. We presume they're here in, in, in Jersey, essentially, because we're something of a backwater, that you've got to make the boat trip to actually get here. And they came from the mainland to get away from yeah. Caesar's armies. More and more of these hordes appeared at, at that time, so we're assuming it was just essentially to sort of hide them here. Early offshore banking? A gag we've heard many times. This was what Caesar's campaign in Gaul was all about, silver and gold. That's why today, finds of coins in France are so rare, because 2,000 years ago, Caesar stole the lot. Caesar and his legions were very definitely on the make. So no surprise his enemies hid those 70,000 coins from him back in Jersey. This man was insatiable. Caesar used Gaul's great wealth to pay off his debts and make his fortune. But now he planned to make his reputation by smashing Rome's oldest foe once and for all. To do that, he had to defeat Gaul's most formidable chieftain, Vercingetorix the wily general who united all of Gaul against the Romans. I've come to Alessia, a hilltop village in central France. 2,000 years ago, it was a substantial, well-defended fortress, where, in 52 BC, Caesar says he finally cornered Vercingetorix and a vast army of Gauls. How would this epic showdown unfold? Caesar says here there were 80,000 rebel Gauls occupying the hilltop town of Alesia. But it's the next bit that makes you understand just how relentless and determined Caesar could be. 
He says it was clearly impregnable except by blockade. So what does he do? But he orders his army to build a wall completely encircling the town. And he says the siege works had a circumference of 10 miles. Eight camps were placed in strategic positions linked together by fortifications. I mean, imagine a fortified wall 10 miles long. I mean, that's a massive civil engineering project. And to think that he had within his legions the manpower and the skills to carry it off. But I don't have to imagine. I'm going to see it for myself. From 10,000 feet over Alesia, I have a view of the battleground that any Roman general would have killed for. From up here, infrared photography reveals subtleties in the landscape invisible to the naked eye. It takes an expert to interpret these images. Quand je vois par là les, les traces, ils sont des lignes de César. Ils sont les lignes de César. C'est l'ensemble de la circonvallation, c'est-à-dire qu'elle fait tout le tour de, de l'hôpital d'Alésia, où était réfugié Vercingétorix, pour empêcher les Gaulois de sortir, pour qu'ils puissent se rendre quand ils n'auraient plus rien à manger. 10 miles of ramparts shut off Alesia from the outside world. But these photographs reveal another line of defenses because Caesar built not one rampart, but two. To find out why, I've come to the site of the battle. These reconstructions of Caesar's earthworks show just how vast they were. Vercingetorix's army took refuge on the hilltop town, and as it was a long hill protected by steep slopes and ramparts, Caesar decided not to attack, but to besiege the Gallic army. And that's why he built this rampart. The first rampart encircled the entire town and faced inwards. It was nine meters high, four meters wide. Caesar's army shifted over a half a million tons of earth and stone to build it. Vercingetorix watched the wall go up around Alesia and quickly sent word to the rest of the Gaulish tribes to raise a huge army of reinforcements. It was his only hope. But Caesar was already one step ahead of him and was preparing a trap. And that's where Caesar's second rampart came in. They built another rampart. Yes, it was to protect him from uh, a not what... Not a counterattack, yeah? Yes, a counterattack. Caesar's second rampart faced outward. It encircled not just Alesia, but the Roman army as well. It was defended by deep ditches, vicious stakes, hidden traps, and towers placed every 30 meters, all designed to keep the Gauls' reinforcements at bay. Now, all Caesar had to do was wait, as for four weeks he laid siege and starved his enemy inside Alesia. To save precious supplies, the Gauls drove their weak and elderly out of the gates and into the no-man's land between the city walls and these ramparts. Caesar describes the scene. They came up to the Roman fortifications and with tears besought the soldiers to take them as slaves and relieve their hunger. But Caesar posted guards on the rampart with orders to refuse them admission. I mean, they were just forced by both sides to starve to death. 
absolutely no hope at all. Only the Gauls' army of reinforcements could save Vercingetorix now. And Caesar's trap was waiting for them. They attacked. And Caesar describes what happened. He writes, the Gauls impaled themselves or were pierced and killed by the spears hurled at them from the ramparts. They did not succeed in penetrating our lines of defense anywhere. Over four days of battle, Caesar says a quarter of a million Gauls were killed and 40,000 more taken captive. Vercingetorix had no choice but to surrender. But Caesar wasn't content with victory alone. There was profit to think of. With his enemy on their knees, he added to his fortune and their misery by selling them as slaves. It says here that Caesar sold over a million captives into slavery and shared the proceeds amongst his army. So you get the sense that he ran his campaigns like a kind of business. Obviously, he had to fight strategic battles, but he always needed a reliable source of funds. With Caesar, money was always at the heart of things. Caesar's massive gamble had paid off. He'd cleared his debts, made his fortune, conquered Rome's ancient enemy, and made his reputation as Rome's greatest general. But Caesar's real battle had yet to begin because his most dangerous enemies were not on the battlefields of Europe. They were waiting for him in the very heart of Rome. Now, here's your chance to experience the sights and sounds of the Eternal City with our fantastic four-night trip to Rome, courtesy of Kirka Holidays. This is no ordinary trip, as you and a friend will fly business class and stay in five-star accommodation in the heart of the city. Soak up the history as you enter the world-famous Colosseum and take in the culture as you explore the city with your own private walking tour. You'll also receive guide notes, concierge service, plus a thousand pounds spending money. So, for your chance to win, text Rome to 85545 or post your name and phone number to Rome, P.O. Box 7557, Derby, D-E-1-0-N-P. Texts cost £1.50 plus one message at your standard network rate. Lines close at midday on the date shown on screen and three days later for postal entries. For rules, go to channel5.com slash win. Fifty BC, Julius Caesar had conquered Gaul and was heading back to Rome, unimaginably rich from the spoils of war, and now one of the Republic's most powerful men. But for Caesar, it was not just about victories on the battlefield. Even from Gaul, he kept a high profile back in Rome by paying for huge public building projects. Like his giant Caesar's Forum. It was once 160 meters long and 75 meters wide. An extravagant development of shops, business premises, and law courts. And Caesar built it smack in the center of Rome, on the city's richest real estate. No expense was spared. We happen to know how much all this cost. Cicero wrote a letter at the time to one of his friends saying, you'll never guess, it's going to cost us 60 million sesterces. By the time it was actually finished, we know the cost had gone up to hundreds million. What's one sesterce worth today? It's really difficult to say what it'd be worth today, but yeah. it would buy you two loaves of bread. Two loaves of bread? Yes. So going by where I shop, that means Caesar spent roughly 200 million pounds on this forum. But it wasn't just a shrewd property investment. His forum dwarfed the Senate building. A message to Rome that even though he was in Gaul, Caesar was a force to be reckoned with. It's about political survival. Caesar has to keep up 
because he's out of town. He has to keep his political currency up. He has to keep his value high. So in a way, it's a kind of a PR exercise. Yeah, it's uh, about making sure that, that nobody forgets him, but also that, look at what I can do. You know, you, you've not seen anything like this. Right. Um, it's not just that I can pull strings at a great distance, but I can do this. Caesar never fails to astonish me. The man's ambition and determination were relentless. And it seems he could do anything he turned his hand to. I suppose, like everybody, I thought Julius Caesar was a general, a leader of men. But in actual fact, he was a property developer. He was a great influence peddler, a PR man, a politician par excellence. He knew how to make loans to the right people at the right time. He was, whatever else, a real operator. Caesar's self-promotion was especially scrutinized by one man his arch enemy, Cato the Younger. He'd followed Caesar's career from the start with disgust and alarm. To him, Caesar was just a lawbreaker playing fast and loose with the principles of the Republic. Now, Cato was left convinced Caesar's ambition was for one thing, sole command of Rome. Cato is someone who makes his reputation on never changing his mind, on never backing down, on always sticking to the absolute letter, the principle, and the way that he projects his image as this stern advocate of traditional virtue is very much like Caesar's constant advertising himself as this flamboyant, capable, gifted, the man who will get things done. Cato is in many senses the man who will stop things from being done unless they're done in the right way. Cato was determined to bring Caesar down. In 53 BC, he got his chance. When the triumvirate, Caesar's key political alliance, began to crack. Pompey was married to Caesar's daughter. When she died unexpectedly, a vital family tie was broken. A year later, Crassus was killed in battle. Rome's status quo was in meltdown and the city in chaos. Senators turned on each other. The fight turned dirty as bribery and mob violence became a fact of daily life. Political gangs clashing in the streets, elections being constantly postponed due to vote rigging, or in one case, an official being knocked unconscious by a brick and then finally, the actual murder of one politician by another here on the Via Appia, the Queen of Rhodes, and the whole thing boiled over into open rioting. Rome was in a state of emergency. The Senate was desperate for a return to order. With Crassus dead and Caesar still on his way back from Gaul, they turned to the one man who could restore calm, Pompey. In desperation, they made him sole consul. Pompey restored law and order in no time and made himself the darling of the Senate, free to enjoy power and to pursue his own agenda. So he had no further use of Caesar, and the triumvirate was dead. As sole consul, Pompey now controlled Rome and he persuaded the Senate to refuse Caesar permission to enter the Republic until he gave up command of his army. It would make Caesar a sitting duck and the perfect target for Cato. He was planning to destroy Caesar, not on the battlefield, but by attacking him in court. With accusations that Caesar's huge profits from Gaul were made illegally through corruption and embezzlement. As he finally arrived back into Italy, Julius Caesar knew his enemies were circling in Rome. I'm heading north, to the place where Caesar made the biggest decision in Roman history. To 
Today, it's a stream. 2,000 years ago, a wide river, and it was called the Rubicon. It marked the Roman Republic's northern boundary. And it was here on January the 10th, 49 BC, that Rome's future was decided. The Senate had refused Caesar permission to advance any further unless he relinquished command of his army. That would have rendered him a private citizen and left him exposed to disastrous legal action by Cato. It would have also given his rival Pompey a golden opportunity to consolidate power himself. So, what was the alternative? Maintain his command, cross the Rubicon, march on Rome, and seize power himself. And that, of course, would have been a declaration of civil war. It would have risked his own fate and the fate of the Republic. Caesar's legionaries were spread out along the banks of the Rubicon, waiting for their leader's command. Caesar breathed three immortal words, Iacta alia est, the die is cast. Then he ordered his men to cross the Rubicon. And those words would tear the Republic apart. It was a declaration of civil war. Caesar and his army stormed towards Rome, but they found the city practically deserted. Terrified senators had fled, while Pompey raced to Greece to raise a massive army. But what did Caesar do? He went straight for the money. And he found it here, Rome's temple of Saturn, and home to the Republic's treasury. Caesar broke in and helped himself to the state's national assets to pay for his war. Caesar records that there are 45,000 bullion bars of silver and gold and 30 million sesterces. So we're talking about a huge pile, a massive treasury. And that's the sort of thing that the city of Rome, being so wealthy, has on standby in cases of emergency like this. So he took the state's fund, the state's emergency fund for himself. Well, at yeah. this point, he is the state. He's yeah. saying, I am the legitimate person here. And it's Pompey. He's the guy that's not legitimate. So I can take over these funds for the well-being of the state. 45,000 bars of gold and silver, 30 million sesterces. I mean, that is a lot of money. I mean, it's even more than he owed when he went to Gaul in the first place. So now he's stealing it. I mean, this man certainly had some nerve. With his army paid in stolen gold, Caesar set out to hunt down Pompey and his allies. For the next three years, Caesar brought the battle to his enemies in every corner of the empire. Across Italy, Spain, Africa, Gaul, until finally he faced down Pompey in Macedonia and destroyed him. Only one man was left, Cato. Cato could see the writing was on the wall. His beloved Republic was in its death throes, his sworn enemy on the verge of victory. So he did what any old school Republican would do. He threw himself on his sword. His servants tried to save him, but Cato could never live under Caesar. The man he felt personified the rot at the heart of the Republic. Cato tore open his wound even further and spilled his bowels at his feet. his arch enemy out of the way, Rome was now Caesar's. And of course, he'd fought long and hard for the Eternal City. But the question is, how long would he hang on to the prize?
Julius Caesar. No one had fought harder for power in Rome. Now, it was finally his. But for how long? Forty-six BC. In 13 years, Caesar had spent just a matter of days in Rome. Now, he planned a homecoming, the mother of all celebrations. Caesar was planning a party to celebrate his triumphs. As a younger man, when he was an edile, he'd shown he could lay on a big bash with some of Rome's most spectacular gladiator shows. But this was something bigger. This was something Rome had never seen the like of before. Caesar was planning the greatest show on earth. It was an ostentatious display that reminded citizens what it meant to be Roman. A giant procession celebrated Rome's legends, its famous victories and the riches of its empire. For 10 days, Caesar's triumph flaunted the great power and wealth of the Roman Republic. This is a real spectacle. You would have seen tens of thousands of people standing around just vying for a view of the parade. And it was a magnificent parade. You've got troops that are chanting and singing all kinds of pageantry, all kinds of spoils of war. What was the, the crowning thing of the whole event? What was that to be? Ultimately, at the end of the procession, it's all eyes focused on Julius Caesar, the general. And outside of the whole procession, would it have been a festival of events? Absolutely. As it were? Part of the process, you as the victorious general, you would have been giving all kinds of goods to the people of Rome. That could be in the form of money, it could be in the form of food or wine. And so you, you, everyone's going to cash in and everyone's winning the lottery because this one guy was successful. Caesar had won power, but to maintain it, the spending had to continue. At the end of the festivities, Caesar gave every one of his legionaries 5,000 denarii. Every centurion got 10,000. Every prefect got 20,000. And a parcel of land each as well. And as if that wasn't enough, every civilian got 100 denarii and a gift of olive oil and wheat. Because for Caesar, it was still spend, 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 even after 13 years of building his power base. Because in Rome, money was power and power was money. But now Rome faced a serious problem. After years of civil war, the Republic was in a state of emergency. Under the Constitution, the Senate could legitimately appoint a dictator to sort out the mess. Guess what? Caesar insisted it was him. The thing to remember is that the state hasn't worked properly for a long time, and there are so many problems that have been ignored or have come up during the years of chaos of civil war. And Caesar doesn't have much time, and there's lots of things to sort out. So Caesar persuaded the Senate to extend his dictatorship, first for three years, then for 10. This was entirely unrepublican and left conservative senators increasingly anxious. The real fear is, how long will this go on? Will there come a point when Caesar will say, right, I've sorted out the problems, we'll go back to the old ways of doing things, I'll step back, we'll use the traditional methods. But Caesar ignored the Senate, grew impatient with debate, and took major decisions alone. When he was at last made dictator for life, it passed a chill over conservative Rome. Caesar was displaying all the trappings of a king, the very thing the Republic was founded to prevent. The state isn't supposed to be run by one man with permanent power. People are uncomfortable, not so much with what Caesar's doing, but with what's going to happen. Will he ever step back? Will a free republic ever return? And that's the deep-seated worry, more than what he's doing. Finally, in 44 BC, worry turned into panic. 60 senators came together to plan drastic action and conspired in a desperate and dangerous plot to save the Republic. They put their notorious plan into action on a now iconic date. 
Sometime before, Caesar got an ominous warning from his soothsayer. Beware the Ides of March. But that wasn't the only omen. Daybreak. Caesar was due to attend a meeting at the Senate that morning. But his wife, Calpurnia, had had a terrible dream in which she was holding his murdered body. Calpurnia begged Caesar to stay at home. And Caesar even sent word that he was too ill to come to the Senate meeting. But one of the conspirators called on his home and persuaded him to attend. On his way to the Senate, Caesar bumped into the soothsayer. Aha, he said, the Ides of March are come. Yes, said the soothsayer, they are come, but they're not yet gone. Late morning. Caesar arrived at the debating chamber. Inside, senators were waiting to start the day's business. Among them, 60 conspirators, each hiding a slender dagger. Caesar entered the chamber. He walked towards his golden chair. But the senators started to cluster around him. And in a violent frenzy, they attacked him with their knives. Caesar was unarmed, and in the crowd of attackers that surrounded him saw the faces of some of his closest allies. Famous names like Cassius, Brutus, men who had fought for Caesar, but who now turned on him. Caesar was stabbed 23 times, and finally, he fell to the floor dead. Caesar's murder was supposed to save the Republic from one-man rule. It didn't. Within 20 years, Rome was under the absolute control of an emperor, the first in a line that lasted for 600 years, and who all chose to bear one common name, Caesar. This age of the Caesars had begun. When I began this journey, the Rome I found consisted of simple huts, which then became a city-state, then a fledgling empire. Rome's ambition was relentless, and that was the reason the Republic came to an end. It was founded to govern a city in the name of the Senate and people of Rome, but it became a vast territory ruled by power-hungry generals. Ultimately, the sacred ideals of the Republic were no match for the greed of mortal men. The Republic was consigned to the past so that Rome and its emperors could be free to pursue their grandest ambition, to grow an empire that covered nearly two million square miles and controlled the lives of a quarter of the world's population. Rome's greatest heights were yet to come. Rome's the capital, but there's a whole country to discover, and that's exactly what we're doing with Alexi, Alex Belixi next tonight. She's heading south to Matera, which isn't called magical for nothing.